And we are going to give the floor to uh, Janos Santi, who is uh, the, from the advisory board of our project from Cloud Thermal. And he will moderate the first session of the conference dedicated to geothermal energy to decarbonize cities. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jana Sani. I will be the moderator of the uh, morning session. Uh, we will have four presentations. Uh, each presenter will have 15 minutes to talk and after you have a chance to, to ask them. And as I see, we have uh, 78 online participants. So if I add the number of people who are being here, so we are close to 100. And uh, I'd like to ask the online participants to use the chat uh, function of the software during the presentation and after it we will read and hope answer the questions. So first I'd like to uh, give the microphone to Adel Manzela, she's here. Uh, his presentation title present and future of geothermal energy in Europe, the vision of the city of the future. So Adel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Buenos dias. Buongiorno. Let's be in permission. I am Adele Manzella. I am from the National Research Council. Thank you. And uh, I was invited, and thank you a lot for this invitation. I was invited to talk about uh, the vision, the city of the future, geothermal for future generation. Um, I am part of the advisory board of this very interesting project and also I participate to the um, European Technology and Innovation Platform for Deep Geothermal. So many of these uh, uh, slides are based on what we achieved when we uh, proposed and we wrote the vision for ATPG, this platform, uh, although I you see, uh, I am taking data from uh, various public uh, documents. Uh, to, to go toward the vision, we have to be uh, aware of what is the situation right now. Um, so the next slide, thank you. We have to be aware, and we just heard uh, how important it is uh, to, be, to, to accelerate the, the energy transition uh because we are very much yeah. so we must be aware how much we rely on uh, on still on uh, hydrocarbon fuels this is the, the situation the picture that i took a few days ago on from uh, eurostat it is uh, updated to 2020 and uh, we see that uh, we are still uh, um, um, uh, rely a lot i'm still relying a lot on uh, hydrocarbon fuels um, and uh, nuclear, but of course, uh, renewables are increasing more and more. But if we go to import the dependency for fuels, uh, we see that the situation is still uh, uh, up to 2020. It is improving with time, of course, but still uh, um, a lot to do uh, in, uh, in Europe from this point of view. This is becoming very critical in the last, uh, in the last weeks. Renewables are increasing. This is the, the general trend in for uh, up to 2020. And uh, uh, renewables are increasing in all countries, European countries. Uh, and you see from this map that uh, the main uh, um, part is played by electrical renewables, uh, although all of them are increasing. We also have to be aware that when we talk about uh, uh, energy demand in Europe, but uh, this is the same in all country, um, most of the, uh, of the demand is on the thermal uses. Uh, this is a picture from uh, uh, Division. Uh, Division was uh, uh, published in, uh, in um, uh, 2018. So I try to update at least the, 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 the share of renewables uh, in the um, so the, the total consumption, but you see on uh, on the left that the main part is still played by by thermal uses. Um, 
This is the situation today. So with the last data published by EJEC in, uh, in its market report 2020, um, the production of geothermal energy in Europe, uh, not uh, in all countries, uh, but uh, most uh, of, the, of the European countries contribute to this uh, with many differences uh, depending on the resource they are uh, based on. Uh, so we see that the ma major player for power production are Turkey, Italy, and Iceland. Um, and uh, for heating, uh, the, 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 the contribution is uh, broader uh, from other countries. But uh, on 2020, the geothermal pro produced uh, just 1.5% uh, of the total primary production at European level. Why is so little? Uh, when we are all running for, for uh, renewables, uh, is it a problem? Uh, what is the problem? And uh, can, uh, can we do more? Uh, we, uh, we think so. Just a, a little perspective, temporal perspective. How did the geothermal grew uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the last decade, uh, at least? This is a picture from uh, the European Geothermal Conference of, uh, 19, uh, of 2019. And you see that uh, uh, only Turkey has uh, increased uh, a lot in the last years. Uh, this is for electrical power production. Uh, Italy, Iceland, uh, who have been the main players in, uh, in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, uh, do not uh, did not uh, increase so much the production in the last uh, decade. Only Turkey did, and uh, the production is still very uh, little uh, for the rest of Europe. And uh, uh, also for heat, uh, the, the the matter is uh, better for for the heating and cooling part, mm, but uh, uh, not all the countries have uh, had uh, at the time of the European Geothermal Conference. Uh, uh, ambitious plan, uh, many ambitious plan for, for geothermal. Um, just uh, uh, in, to give an idea of uh, the geothermal heat production includes uh, uh, district heating that you here see in red and uh, the other geothermal direct uses, mainly space heating, uh, but also balneology is included in the yellow part that you see in this, uh, in this picture. So this is the situation of geothermal right now, but uh, is it because geothermal has uh, main problems? For example, one perception may be that it, it costs uh, more than other renewables. Uh, the last data, this, uh, this I took this uh, picture from a, a document from a Jacob that uh, is taken from uh, IEA source. Geothermal is the cheapest source for heat. This is the, the, the picture. So electric ground source, heat pumps, uh, appears to be very, very competitive with respect to other to the other uh, heating and cooling technologies, but also from the point of view of power production, the life cycle cost of geothermal energy is uh, very competitive with other with other renewables. So this, this is also a picture from the from our vision, but uh, and the situation of course is changing, but it isn't didn't change so much uh, on this respect. So it's not a matter of cost. Um, uh, it's not a matter of potential. We have a large potential both for, for um, power production. Um, many, many countries in Europe have a large potential for power production, not only the most obvious one uh, using the technologies that have been used for decades. Um, also, if we go to district heating, this is a partial situation because uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this picture, uh, we wanted to illustrate uh, uh, how many areas could be, uh, from a geological point of view, could be uh, useful for district heating in urban areas in Europe. Uh, there are also other areas that are not depicted here, uh, just because uh, we lacked data at the time. But uh, data are becoming more and more available uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the help of the various projects that are running in the last years. Another important factor, another important thing about geothermal is it is uh, flexible. It's not a matter of producing power or heat or heating and cooling uh, with continuity, but it is flexible. So we can uh, 
and with the optimization of technologies, we can um, um, change the production and switch from, uh, for example, from electrical to, to heating, uh, uh, adapting to the request. This is a, a main uh, advantage of geothermal energy and uh, um, may be integrated, but of course, all this must be organized, must be coordinated, must be made smart in a way, no? um, in, uh, especially in, uh, in urban areas. Um, this again is uh, a picture, and this is uh, a visionary picture of geothermal energy. The many messages that we need to go to, to, to give uh, outside. Key messages, it is, uh, of course, it is uh, local, indigenous, it is uh, uh, continuous. Uh, we have a large potential, we have, it is a sustainable, um, uh, can optimize the system. Uh, if we, if if I had to renew the the division now, for sure we would add uh, another another message here on, on this table: uh, clean mobility, because uh, the, the the research on uh, lithium from geothermal blinds is improving, is in, uh, growing. And uh, the potential is still to be set, but uh, there is a more and more interest also from this point of view. So geothermal has many advantages. What we want to achieve, this is uh, the vision, this uh, is a synthesis of the messages that we gave uh, some years ago, but uh, they are still there. So we want to cover uh, a large part, uh, a significant part of uh, um, the demand for domestic heat and for electrical power in, in, uh, in Euro. And to do this, uh, we have to rely on uh, the flexibility of geothermal supply. So not only on the availability of geothermal, uh, availability of uh, resources, availability of uh, technologies, uh, um, but also on the flexibility. And these uh, may provide uh, a large contribution to uh, centralize as well as uh, decentralized uh, um, options uh, for, for, for energy. We also uh, want to increase the social welfare, uh, developing geothermal energy in, uh, in Europe. And this means uh, um, guarantee a lower environmental footprint. Uh, and there are uh, projects running, more and more projects running on these, uh, but the technology in any case are still uh, uh, are already uh, very strong and very robust as we, we, we uh, proved uh, in a recent uh, project uh, where we described uh, all the technologies already set for mitigating environmental uh, um, impacts and risks and, uh, and setting you know, the, the goals for future, for future technology. And Geothermal wants to create wealth. This means uh, local job investments. This is uh, uh, the, the, the economic part of the, of, uh, the energy, but uh, it's not only production, energy production, which is uh, a, main, uh, a main goal, especially in these days, uh, but also uh, business for, for, for our industries that are already uh, at a, a very, very high level uh, at the global, uh, in the global uh, business, but also um, jobs, investments in, uh, in the European countries. Um, it, by it, dissemination, education and outreach, uh, we want to increase uh, awareness. Um, a awareness that also goes uh, beyond uh, what has been done for, for years because uh, your thermal technology technologies uh, have been running for a while, uh, but uh, the energy transition is going in the direction of uh, uh, a stronger mutual exchange of perspectives. So it's not only a matter of business, it's not only an economic or technology part, but uh, the social part is increasing and is uh, um, taking uh, uh, more and more interest. So uh, it is important to hear, to uh, learn how to um, that, how to increase the dialogue. And from this point of view, crowd thermal is bringing a, a crucial uh, uh, contribution on this, uh, on this part. 
and uh, as well as uh, on protein, uh, pro protecting and empowering the customers. So consumers that are becoming more and more prosumers. This is uh, for geothermal, this applies only for part of the technologies, but still there. So uh, uh, crowd thermal is very much rooted in the vision uh, and uh, can contribute a lot on this, uh, on this vision. So the last uh, uh, picture from my side is the vision uh, uh, of the future, the future uh, of geothermal in uh, urban areas. We, with uh, geothermal technologies, there's so many geothermal technologies and application, we contribute uh, in all the parts of, uh, of uh, urban areas, uh, uh, bringing uh, power through the grid, um, we, we are not planning to have so many power plants in urban areas, but we contribute to the, to the, uh, to the power from, uh, from outside, but mainly on uh, heating and cooling application, especially in uh, a coordinated way, because uh, urban areas uh, and uh, energy transition involve all renewable energies and uh, all these must be organized and uh, coordinated well. So um, urban areas in, uh, in uh, we want to have uh, urban areas 100% uh, renewable uh, as, regards, uh, as regards energy and uh, independent on, uh, on, on uh, uh, other resources. We can achieve this, we can achieve by uh, setting the right tools and the right tools are not only technological, and not only uh, economical, but uh, regards a lot of policy. And this is the main, the crucial part uh, that we have to discuss, especially if we want to develop uh, quickly geothermal and uh, improve the share of geothermal energy in the, in the global uh, asset. Um, because geothermal have many peculiarities and uh, uh, it is not uh, uh, something that we can set uh, immediately. So now we, we hear about uh, tools for improving uh, uh, renewables uh, in a matter of 18 months. Uh, for geothermal, we need uh, tools and we need uh, uh, instruments for setting up a policy that uh, uh, make geothermal um, reliable not in the short term, but in the medium and long term. And uh, because this is very much the, one of the main advantages of geothermal, the continuity, the, the life cycle uh, uh, efficiency uh, should be recognized uh, at the European uh, level and at the global level. So this is uh, our dream and uh, we are all going together in uh, achieving this dream. Thank you for your attention. So Adam, thank you for your nice overview. And I'd like to announce the next presenter, Gregor Gust, uh, who is coordinator of Geothermal District Heating Cities Cost Action. His presentation is Geothermal District Heating Cities Contribution to Decarbonizing Cities. Uh, as you see, uh, uh, Gregor will be uh, they'll keep his presentation online. Hi, Gregor. Hello, good morning. And thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, lovely conference. I'm really sorry that I cannot be with you. Uh, still, uh, it's uh, quite difficult with all the pandemic situation in Austria, but yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm happy to join at least online and I hope you all of you can hear me well. So I will, uh, otherwise, please interrupt me if you cannot hear me well. I will share my screen now and start with my presentation. So, yeah, I think you should be able to see it. So um, let me please introduce myself. My name is Pierre Götzle. I'm working at the Geological Survey of Austria. And uh, since 2019, I'm chair of the EU Cost Action Geothermal DHC, which addresses the integration of geothermal energy in heating and cooling networks, not only district heating, but also small uh, local scale heating cooling networks. 
since this year, I'm also chair of uh, GeoEnergy uh, inside the EU Geo Survey um, expert group on, on GeoEnergy. So you see, I've um, made different roles and I'm working for the Geological Survey of Austria. So today, my presentation will focus on four main questions uh, with regard to the integration of geothermal energy in heating and cooling networks in an urban environment. First of all, I would like to raise the question why it's important to talk about uh, geothermal in an urban uh, setting and what needs to be considered uh, to do so. Uh, I will briefly introduce the technologies, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that most of you are aware of it, so I'll keep it very briefly but uh, also uh, think, uh, provide some arguments why somebody should choose or could choose a geothermal energy in heating cooling networks. I will raise the, um, answer the question, um, what needs to be done to foster the use and promote the use more in the future? Uh, what are emergent tasks? What are the long-term tasks? And finally, I would like to point also to the contribution of my cost action. And as it is not an inclusive, uh, exclusive group, but it's an inclusive network, I also like to send an invitation for, to industry research members. Um, you, it's possible to join this action and collaborate. The picture, what you can see here, and I'm very proud of it, is um, the first successful well test in the city of Vienna. Uh, I will just um, open my pointer. Here we go. Should work. Yeah. So this test uh, um, um, trapped water uh, from depths of three kilometers at uh, 95 uh, centigrees uh, in December, very shortly before Christmas in the city of Vienna. And it is hopefully the starting point to use uh, natural thermal water in the district heating um, network of Vienna, which is, by the way, the third largest uh, network in, in Europe. So why it's important to talk about uh, geothermal energy in an urban setting? First of all, uh, we need to consider that already now 75% of European population lives in cities and or urban conglomerates, including suburban spaces, and it, this number will increase in the next 20 years or 30 years. So uh, the United Nations is expecting about 85% in, in, uh, by 2050 in Europe. So uh, urban areas have uh, disadvantages and have advantages. The, one of the disadvantages uh, from the urban point of view is they are of course more sensitive towards climate and environmental impact, including heat, dust, emissions. Um, and they are of course more sensitive uh, to um, the impact of using energy, starting uh, also including land consumption and tower supply chains. On, on the other hand, uh, urban areas, uh, in contrast to uh, rural areas, uh, normally offer higher income levels so that they uh, have a higher financial power uh, have, and have the, the advantage that they have high energy demand densities uh, on the one hand, but lacking of space. And uh, the subsurface um, on, a, on, on below a city, uh, you can use it in multiple ways. It, it's not just one technology in the future which will supply or one even one geothermal technology. But normally, um, most of the European cities are in basin areas. So you have a, a groundwater table, you have a brackish water in greater depths. You probably have uh, um, um, high temperature aquifer systems in large depths, and you have a bedrock. Um, and there are various technologies, as I will indicate in my next picture, um, that how you can use the subsurface. You're not just talking about extracting heat anymore. Um, in Austria, a lot of people already say, uh, say geothermal 2.0, uh, meaning that it's a shift, especially the lower, lower temperature systems from energy production to energy storage. And uh, you can perfectly integrate uh, these geothermal systems in the urban infrastructure. Uh, taking benefits from uh, tunnels, from uh, building foundations. So it's a, a large spectrum one can use. Here you see a general scheme, uh, um, which I will not explain in detail. So uh, geothermal DHCL, our approach looks also at the, at the small scale local systems for individual use or large building or the complex of individual use. Of course, we also look at the deep systems and uh, um, for district heating uh, and combined heating and power. 
as I indicated here, most of the systems, they ha uh, have a very uh, high TOL, uh, especially when we look at individual application, we can uh, say there is a well-established market uh, on, the, on ground source heat pumps at TOLs uh, to nine. Uh, when we go more to the, to the depth, of course, uh, it reduces slightly, and especially when we look at all these unconventional systems, uh, like um, enhanced shear thermal systems, uh, also underground uh, uh, storage, at greater depths, which is now developing, starting to have the first pilots, uh, but not yet market ready, and uh, similar things apply, of course, to the integration of uh, geothermal energy into district heating cooling networks, when we not just look about uh, monovalent use or bivalent use, but looking at uh, multivalent uh, energy systems. Um, my previous speaker, Adela, already mentioned, uh, showed some numbers from the Edric Market Report. I just collected some uh, figures uh, looking especially on, on district heating and cooling uh, on direct geothermal energy use. I'm not uh, talking about the low temperature system, as, as you can see here. Uh, the situation, of course, uh, there is Turkey and Iceland, as mentioned before, which uh, uh, due to the high resources uh, use a lot of heat, uh, but we ha also have uh, the Paris uh, greater area, which is a, a perfect example of uh, how you can use geothermal for district heating, even though you don't have magmatic systems or high temperature systems. But for the rest of Europe, you can see it's quite uh, spread uh, with single installations and only some local ac accumu uh, accumulations of, um, uh, or let's say, a systematic use of geothermal for district heating or heating cooling systems, especially in Hungary uh, and nowadays also in the Netherlands. In total, we are talking about a two gigawatt uh, thermal energy of installed capacities in, in direct use, uh, most of them for district heating. And as I indicated in my next slide, it's still quite small systems. Uh, in addition, we, the, from this is taken from a publication of 2019. The number might not be correct anymore. We also consider around uh, 50, uh, fifth, so called fifth generation district heating or local heating and cooling networks using geothermal uh, spread across uh, Europe with uh, very innovative approaches in Switzerland, in Denmark, for instance, in Sweden. So this is a, a, a new sector which is uh, uh, starting to grow. In the end, uh, and this also needs to be considered, uh, the share is still very small. So we're talking about 1% uh, uh, on a global scale uh, of geothermal in the district heating sector and in the uh, European heating cooling sector around two to three percent, which is dominated by individual uses so far. So when we look uh, at the typical, um, let's say typical, um, um, statistically typical uh, uh, geothermal direct use uh, for, for uh, heating cooling networks, we are still look at moderate temperatures. So this is uh, taken also from the market report 2021. You can see here not all uh, of the registered um, installations are covered in this statistic, but it's just trying to indicate some trends. So when we look at the different, the average uh, median value for the temperature of the reservoir is around 70 degrees and the typical um, capacity is uh, below 10 megawatt, which is very similar in Austria. So, um, that, and this was a tradition, having small local networks, you have the resource, to develop uh, a, a local heating network around. Uh, and, and that's, yeah, uh, that was more or less how, how, in my opinion, how the last decades, especially in Austria, developed. And now we need to make a shift. Here, uh, you see one picture about the low, low, uh, low temperature heating cooling networks from the previously mentioned uh, publication. And I indicated all these sources which are somehow related to uh, geothermal, even the shallow subsurface groundwater and so on. And as you can see, the uh, geothermal or the subsurface, the ground is a very important source for this uh, low temperature heating cooling networks. So how, how do they work? In the end, you just connect buildings, uh, but you, you change the concept of uh, heating network from a hierarchical to a, a non-hierarchical unstructured uh, array. This could be a ring, a circle, where you connect the different buildings consuming heat and cold. So they, all the buildings are interconnected somehow via this grid. The grid is more or less a, a marketplace. You can call it for heat and cold. And geothermal has this uh, special uh, role, not just to provide 
uh, energy, heat or cold, but also to, to save uh, store it uh, during um, the seasons. And that's why you see there's a lot of involvement of uh, shadow geothermal in this uh, system. So looking at the heating and uh, district heating cooling market in Europe, and these are uh, numbers which I took from 2019, they might be a little bit different. Uh, is, this is also not a, a major so, uh, major technology use. So we have a, a share of around 12% in Europe. Here you can see the gray shaded color sch schemes are still fossil, uh, gas, oil, and coal. And um, you can see that it indicates that there are three different groups we need to address uh, of European countries. First of all, these so-called, I call them front runners. These are, are countries, especially in the Scandinavian area, where you already have a traditionally or recently have a high share of district heating, a high share of renewables already, uh, and uh, partly also a high share of electricity. But uh, on the other hand, a low share of fossil fuels. The other group uh, where I could also partly include my own country, uh, but this is also valid for Central Europe and Eastern Europe, you have a high share or an enhanced share of uh, district heating. But uh, on the other hand, you have a moderate share of renew uh, renewables in the heating sector, uh, still high share of fossil. So meaning that these are systems which have been installed in the last 30 to 50 years. More, uh, to a significant uh, share operating on fossil fuels, and we need to consider solutions to turn them into uh, uh, green district heating networks, uh, probably uh, or partly by using uh, geothermal energy. The third group, uh, this applies uh, to Western, Southwestern countries where there is no tradition on using district heating, as you can see, is uh, countries where it's almost zero. Uh, but you have individual boilers, uh, uh, you also have a very high share of fossil, meaning that individual boilers are mostly operated by fossil fuels. And these are also challenges because uh, we need to consider ways how, how to introduce uh, district heating uh, um, to these um, countries. And why should we do this? That's an, another important question. Uh, um, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, especially for urban areas, we can really benefit from the different sources which are available, uh, like waste heat from the supermarket and so on. Uh, we don't consume space, so we shift the energy system um, to the subsurface. We reduce our dependency on energy imports, uh, and uh, which is also not so easy in urban environments. Even if you use biomass, you need some storage uh, and you need surface space to do so. So why not using the subsurface uh, for um, um, providing energy? But from my opinion, the most important aspect is the efficiency. And this is indicated here in this graph. So we will, uh, in the future, if you want to get be more self-sustaining, less depending on, uh, let's say, gas imports from Russia and so on, we need to be uh, very careful how we invest our high enthalpy energy sources. And we should more use what is uh, available around us, uh, often summarized in the term ambient heat. But geothermal, of course, is more than just ambient heat. We, we have uh, uh, also have high temperature sources. So when you look at the energy conversion factor, and this was taken from a publication, I, uh, which is in, 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 um, under review, and I, I liked, uh, uh, and I took some ideas out of it. So if you compare with direct electrical heating, you have an energy conversion factor of one, meaning one portion of electricity gives you one portion of heat. It gets better when you use air source heat pumps, but it gets even better if you use, use ground source heat pumps, uh, uh, being up to six, seven, depending how you operate, if you use groundwater and so on. But when you look at direct from energy use, and that's uh, uh, the great thing, you take one portion of electricity and get out or, or gas uh, and uh, take out uh, 20 to 30 portion of heat, which means you can save these high entropy carriers and 25% and, 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 uh, of our end consumption is about space heating. And space heating is a uh, temperature levels uh, up to 60, 70 degrees, depends on your radiation system. So why using electricity for such systems when we have large uh, uh, potential on ambient and geothermal to cover this need? And geothermal DHCs, they operate exactly at this high efficiency scale. So that's a, a, a major argument 
why um, why to use a few firmware. And there is a good match between different few firmware technologies and different generation of district heatings. Probably maybe not for the first generation, but I would have excluded a more or less from the future perspective. I talked about the fifth generation, but nowadays most uh, district heating systems are two, can generation two with uh, hot water above 90 degrees, 100 degrees, or generation three with um, hot water pipelines up to 90 degrees Celsius. And the lower the temperature of your system get, the more different sources you can integrate. And this is indicated here on the right hand side with a different uh, geothermal categorization. However, in the cost action, we believe that the future network, or the future uh, geothermal uh, heating cooling network will not be a monoland or bivalent solution. It will combine the benefits of geothermal with other renewable sources, as geothermal might be used for base load, for storage, which uh, increases the flexibility of the system, uh, and using uh, fluctuating renewables uh, like solar, for instance, uh, uh, which are of uh, low investment costs, to, to um, provide to support the system and capitalize uh, excess heat by storage. We can still use for peak load supply, uh, flexible low capex systems like uh, biomass electricity, green gas, but we will save capacities for other industrial purposes. So there's a lot of things that needs to be done to promote uh, um, and foster the use of geothermal and district heating cooling system. Adela mentioned it before, there's a, a low awareness still, and this is something where, where we as experts need to, to promote more, but there are more than this. So we have still have um, um, technical issues, especially to scale up uh, uh, the systems to, to larger uh, uh, a group of, uh, uh, let's say, geothermal plants supplying one uh, uh, larger district heating system instead of small scale systems. We have still have problems with the legal framework. It is, is the legal framework in many countries is not ready to really uh, support the licensing of geothermal energy. It's uh, old fashioned. Uh, uh, and this that also includes a qualification of staff at authorities. So authorities need to uh, evaluate more and more um, of these systems in the future, and they need to be trained on this. The financing uh, was mentioned before with the high first investment cost upfront costs, but low operational costs. So this is a, uh, also where Cord Firma looks at that we need to be more social inclusive with these te technologies. Uh, and uh, yeah, and we should be also very um, aware of critical opinions and it can easily turn uh, uh, the, the, the page against geothermal if you don't operate on high safety and environmental standards. So as, I, as I'm at the end of my speaking time, I just give you a few words about cost, uh, my cost action. So we are not a research project. We are not an official network or official organization. Cost is a EU fund, funding agency who supports scientific to industry networks. So we started in end of 2019. So most of our time we are living under the pandemic situation, but we reached a network from around uh, 40 countries with around 100 researchers and I would like to pronounce that this network is open for industrial uh, partners so if you are interested in the work of integrating children energy and heating cooling networks please feel free to join this uh, our network we do a lot of different things uh, organizing uh, repositories fact sheets webinars we have a, a new web portal which is going into uh, operation this month so this will be kind of the hub we would like to use for from the future and uh, you find a lot of uh, interesting uh, details, uh, fact sheets and um, best practice or examples across Europe uh, from, from autumn this year on. So here you can see um, the web address and um, yeah, I thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to, to answer questions and discuss later on. Thank you, give me back, uh, back to you. So thank you, Gregor. Uh, I need to say it's quite impressive what you do in Vienna Basin Geothermal Research. Congratulations. So let's go to the third presenter. Uh, he is Gabor Bojo from Inogao. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> the presenter is Tomasz Medjesz. 
uh, the title of his presentation, Geothermal and Restrict Heating Examples from Crotherma Case Studies in Hungary. Tomasz, please. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tamás Medjas. I'm a Chief Operations Officer of the District Heating Company of Szeged. And uh, I'm happy to be here and uh, I would like to share my uh, presentation with you. Um, Szeged is a, a medium-sized city, medium-sized city in Hungary. And uh, there are many things that uh, people of Szeged like to be uh, uh, remembered of. Uh, we have a good handball team and, and, and we make some good salamis and, and also we have a good university. But, uh, but, but probably the, the context that you can hear the name of, the name of Szeged most is, is geothermal nowadays. And the reason for this is that we are switching the district heating of Szeged to geothermal. And, and I believe that this is the, the largest uh, geothermal district heating overhaul in Europe right now. This is not going to be the largest geothermal district heating network. But, uh, but this is a 100% natural gas-based system, and we are switching it over to geothermal, and I believe that right now this is the largest overhaul of this kind. So this is Szeged. It's uh, on the southeastern part of Hungary, and uh, the district heating uh, uh, system uh, heats 27,000 apartments. So it's quite a large system, 27,000 apartments and 500 public buildings. These are in four and 10 story uh, uh, housing projects. Uh, if you like, these are mostly uninsulated buildings uh, built in the 80s where, where uh, gas was cheap and uh, the, the summers were less extreme. So there is no cooling and, and the heating is provided by, by our network. Uh, in 2018, uh, we started a large overhaul. We started planning earlier and, and now we are in the middle of, of uh, switching our systems to geothermal. This is our network. It's uh, quite widespread around the city. It, uh, some of the, uh, there are 23 uh, heating circuits. Some of these are interconnected, some of them are not. Uh, it's a good and a bad thing at the same time. It's good because if there is a, there is a, a, a a break or there is, a, there is, there is some uh, technical difficulties, then not the entire system goes blank. Uh, we, we are still able to provide service to most of the apartments. It's, uh, it's, it, it would be better, we, we, like, we would like to uh, uh, interconnect most of the pipelines because then we could transfer the, uh, uh, the heat from one heating circuit to, to the other. Uh, we have uh, uh, 235 megawatt installed capacity and uh, uh, actually because there are no uh, heavy industry in the city, we are the largest uh, CO2 emitter. So we are, this is, this is a, not a very nice thing, but uh, it is what it is. Um, we have uh, worked together with the local companies, the local university and, and, uh, and also national agencies and we applied for European Union funding and we did receive funding and we, together with these uh, companies and research centers, uh, we started the project uh, two or three years ago. We have all seen uh, similar maps like this. I'm not saying this is the most accurate one, but it does show that Hungary and particularly Southeastern Hungary is very potent uh, geologically, geothermically. Uh, it, 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 this, is, this is a good base for geothermal projects. Also, we must know that there are not too many uh, large cities in that part of Hungary, Szeged being the largest. Uh, it is quite obvious that Szeged is going to be or will be a good base for geothermal district heating. This is the southeastern part of Hungary. And as you can see, there are lots of or many towns. These are rather smaller towns uh, with uh, geothermal usage. Actually, there are a lot more where there are spas, but, uh, but these are the ones when, 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 there, are, when, when there is a, a, a geothermal energy uh, use. Uh, Mora Halom on the, on the southwest of Szeged is, is a particularly interesting town, and my, the next presenter is going to talk about that. Uh, my presentation is about Szeged. Um, 
So there is an existing uh, geo, uh, uh, district heating infrastructure in Szeged. And what we wanted to do is, uh, is drill wells in the city. And uh, as the uh, previous presenter noted, there are, there are not too many, uh, and, and the presenter before that noted, not too many open spaces in cities. And, and, and it, it was really a, a, a challenge to find a suitable place for, uh, for drillings. But uh, we managed to do so. And, uh, and uh, started our project. Actually, we weren't the first ones in the city of Saget to do geothermal. There are already two existing uh, privately owned geothermal systems. And these are usually uh, mentioned as the university systems because they heat the buildings of the university mostly. Uh, some some uh, uh, municipal buildings too, but most of these buildings belong to the local university. Uh, uh, the interesting thing about this, and the reason I'm showing this is because uh, I wish uh, we had some of the crowd thermal tools that we have now. Uh, actually, it was, it was not a very easy thing to persuade the university to, to uh, integrate geothermal into the, into the heating system. Actually, it was quite hard. Uh, we approached the university and, and, and you know, we, we had uh, our presentations to them and, and we, 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 we tried to persuade them. And uh, in all honesty, they said no. Uh, they said that, that the risk is just too high. And, and then another approach uh, was involved when, when it was, when, when, it turned, when, when we offered them that this is not going to be their system. We are going to, or actually not we, but, but another company is going to drill and operate the whole system. And we are just going to sell the heat to them. And then they said, yes, then they said, it's okay. But, but then obviously the risk was not theirs. So that, that, was, the, that was the way it was done uh, in, in 2013. But these two systems have worked very well since then and, and performed very well. And they sort of ease the anxieties of, of, of the people, of, of the uh, stakeholders, of decision makers. And uh, by the time uh, time came for us to, 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 to tell the municipality that, that, that we would like to switch the district heating to geothermal, uh, there were not so many uh, problems with persuading them. So these are the sites of the extraction wells, and uh, there are there are nine of them. Uh, uh, a few of them are already operating. Uh, we are drilling two wells at the same time. There are two drilling rigs working in the city. They are they are working 24/7 uh, for four months, three or four months at a site. So it's quite a nuance, in a sense, for the people. It's it's quite problematic. We get lots of complaints uh, about the noise and, and and the smell and the mess. And, and, and we can totally understand the people. It's, 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 it's absolutely uh, right for them to complain. Uh, we are trying our best communicating with them and we are using the crowd thermal tools. And, and that's the reason we are in this project and, and, and we, are, we are very happy that, that we have access to these tools. Uh, we poll the people, we, 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 we talk to them, we, we organize a sort of a, a out of the box, uh, uh, utilize out of the box approaches to we, we organize walks to the rigs and and uh, and invite school groups and and show them the heating plans and things like that so we try to be proactive in this sense and, and try to reach out and engage the people these are the new pipelines that are being laid again this is this is you can imagine that it causes quite a mess in the city but uh, this has to be done these are the heating plants where, where the uh, thermal water enters and where we utilize its heat content. The thermal water does not enter the, the heating circuit. Uh, uh, we use heat exchangers and, and uh, once it, its heat content in, is utilized in the heating centers, it is being re-injected into the, into the 18 uh, re-injection wells that uh, we are doing right now again. Uh, this is a, this is the as far as we are concerned, this is the only sustainable solution of, of using geothermal. Uh, there are there, there is a there is a quite a quite a large lobby in, in Hungary uh, with regards to uh, uh, agricultural use where where they uh, promote uh, you know one way systems, just uh, uh, production and no injection. Uh, we believe that uh, on the long run, this is the only way to make geothermal uh, sustainable.
Um, we have received funds from a, a European, uh, from the European Union. This is a, 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 a ERDF fund that uh, we are using, but uh, our, we have side projects and, uh, and we also have Horizon 2020 funding and the, and the Norway grant funding. These are on the softer side of the, of the development, but uh, we are happy, very happy for this and, and, and we like to be involved in these uh, international projects. Okay, and these are the individual heating circuits. I'm not going to uh, detail them all one by one. Uh, I'm just going to point out that these are 4,000, 3,000, 4,000 apartments uh, per each uh, heating circuit. And uh, it's, it's, it's really a good thing for us because this is a more manageable uh, uh, size of, of, of population and more manageable size of apartments and, and, and technology. And, and it's, uh, it, it opens up new possibilities for us. Uh, we can talk to these people and, 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 and we can approach them as a, as a, as a, as a unit, uh, if you like, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a group of people, uh, certainly more manageable than, than 27,000 of them. And, and, and we, can, uh, we can talk uh, to them about uh, even crowdfunding and, and other opportunities like energy communities. And, and prosumer actions and things like that. Uh, now I must tell you that this is a this is a long shot uh, uh, in in Hungary and probably in Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe right now. But uh, but uh, on the on the medium and long term, we, we certainly believe that we can we can form energy communities uh, with our end users or persuade them to 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 set up energy communities. And one particular area where we believe we can succeed in this is domestic hot water production. Because we are producing domestic hot water in our heating centers. And, and, and uh, it's just not sustainable. It's just not economically uh, uh, viable the way we do this right now. Because around 50% of the energy that we use to heat domestic hot water or tap water is, gets lost while the water is in the pipelines because we just need to pump it too far away into these buildings. And the idea is to, 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 to set up uh, photovoltaics on, on the roofs of these uh, 10 or four story buildings and produce uh, DHW locally together with the, with, the, with the end users. That would be a nice thing. And that's, some, that's, 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 that's a thing that we pursue. And we believe that we can succeed in the, in the next years probably. So these are our, again, our heating circuits. Some of these are already uh, uh, on geothermal, some are being uh, built as we speak now, and some are getting uh, ready in the next one or two years. Actually, this is, this is one of the areas where the, uh, where the houses, uh, as you can see, where the houses are quite far away from the, from the heating uh, centers. This is an area where we would like to uh, produce uh, DHW locally. Um, we have a lot of site projects and, and uh, some of these uh, include research and development. Uh, we have, we have, I think we have seen it all uh, with regards to what, what uh, problems we can have in, in geothermal production. And, and uh, these include corrosion and scaling. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a big problem. Uh, uh, we have had clogging of, of injection wells, not in Saged, but, uh, but in the cities nearby. Uh, interaction of wells, I mean, these are 28 wells in, a, in, a, in, a, in a quite a small area. There is a high methane content, and that's that's really something that we do not talk about too much. But it is a, it is an issue that we need to address. Uh, the, the, these wells emit methane. There is no two ways about it. And uh, and what we can do is obviously put uh, put CHP engines on them, and we will do that. But uh, that takes time. And there are the social concerns. I mean, people. And it, well, it's interesting because because people do have uh, concerns, but uh, but I think the, our perception is that uh, based on the polling that we did and, and and based on our interaction with the people, is that it's not as bad as as we thought it would be. Uh, I mean, they are they 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 understand that it's a, it's a good project. They understand that geothermal is good for them. What is a, a particular problem is in 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 our case is that we are not going to be able to sell the heat to them for any lower price. The, the price of, uh, of district heating is going to be the same. The air is going to be cleaner. 
and that's 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 uh, that's that's the selling point and that's what we uh, need to emphasize um these are our partners and and this includes you uh, again thanks for having us uh, uh, the blue dots uh, represent the crowd thermal project and the and the red dots uh, represent the uh, uh, the norway uh, fund a uh, project but uh, we are open to other cooperation obviously so once again uh, this is our this is our full uh, this is the full outline of the uh, heating networks in Saga. This includes the two uh, privately owned uh, uh, circuits too. But this is quite, I think this looks quite good. It, it shows that, that basically we are switching like almost 90% of our end users are going to receive uh, geothermal by the end of next year. So this, that's, 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 that's what we would like to, uh, that's what we would like you to remember of Saga. Uh, that's it, and thank you very much. So we continue with the Hungarian other example, Gabor Bozsó. Hey, also welcome everyone here and in the online space. Uh, I'm very glad to be here, and thank you for the invitation and the possibility. So present. Um, Quite a small project, but I think it's um, very interesting. So, I would like to give you a brief presentation about a decarbonized uh, project, which uh, is building in Morahalom. Uh, in the previous presentation, you got information about the location of Saged. Morahalom is a very small city near to Saged in, in the south system part of, of Hungary. And uh, despite of that fact, the city is very well known as, as a spa city in Hungary because the thermal water usage for spa uh, is, is very famous. So here just briefly. The small village means that uh, it has uh, about 6,000 inhabitants. So it's, it's very small uh, compared to Turkish or Icelandic uh, uh, projects. So, but it's very well known uh, as a spa city for decades. Uh, it, the, the city has two operating geothermal system for decades, at least the decades, uh, I think. Uh, and uh, we think with our colleague that uh, the project can be a good uh, and fruitful candidate for crowd thermal pilot. So um, I am here as a member of InnoGeo Limited, but we are colleague with Tamash, who was the previous presenter. I am the technical director of district heating company of Seged, but of course we have we have a lot uh, connection to other project. So that's why I would like to show you some basic geothermal and uh, mechanical data. So Hungary is very well known as a as a quite good condition in geothermal uh, way. Uh, why is it? Here, so the earth's crust is more thinner than the average. It means uh, about 25 kilometers, and that's why we have a quite big and, and huge geothermal gradient. It means uh, that uh, it's, it's five and six Celsius degree uh, pro 100 meters, and the heat flux is very high, about uh, uh, about uh, 100 uh, milliwatts. So, Morhalom is a small city, but uh, it has a quite huge uh, spectrum of thermal water usage. The productive thermal water is used for, uh, where is the pointer here? Used for public buildings, heating, uh, for spa usage, uh, for a lot of horticultural usage. Uh, mostly in greenhouses, and uh, the city has two spa and the swimming pool. Okay, and uh, 
this figure shows you the the three system the red one and the, the blue one is is the operating system and the, the green one is is under building now um, i am engineer so i would like to show you some data uh, it's quiet small but it's it's very important in in this size of uh, of build with, with, uh, towns so the two operating system has uh, a, an annually uh, two, 20 uh, thousand gigajoule consumption and uh, we can reduce the natural gas usage uh, about uh, a half million cubic meter in the, the nominal capacity is about uh, two and five megawatts and uh, every system has uh, operate uh, operates with one production and two reinjection well. Okay, what was the reason and the aim of, of building the new third project? The, the most important thing is the lack of energy. It means that uh, we have not enough geothermal energy to heat all the connected buildings. So that's why we have to build a new one. And uh, the, the reducing of oper operating costs, it's, it's, it's most important. Everyone knows the, the natural grass prices is uh, increasing day by day. And we have a lot of uh, scaling problems because of the geochemical uh, conductions. So the aim of, of the project was to make new production well. Uh, we install uh, two combined heat and power plants, the CHPs, and we install a solar mini plant, means under 50 kilowatts. And the R&D part of the project is to linking uh, into uh, one, the three geothermal system. And of course, we would like to analyze the chemical parameters during the heating period in the systems. So you don't have to be scared. I want it uh, detailed and analyzed, but uh, I would like to just show you the complexity of the three system linking. Here you can see the two operating system and here in the middle, you can see the, the, the new one. Uh, it's, it's the most biggest part of the R&D project in, in this system and what are the main numbers of the project? Uh, one production and one reinjection will be installed and built. And uh, three kilometer power line will be built. And it means that same to the two operating system, uh, we have about 25,000 gigajoule new geothermal energy in the system. And uh, of course, we we use uh, our new CHP and uh, solar power. What are the R and D activity in the project? We investigate the methane and the carbon dioxide separation because it's very important to to um, normalize the CHP using, and we. We made a lot of geophysical diagnostics of production wells because they are in connection and then we have to know the, the contribution each to the whole uh, operation. Geochemical measurements of this of solution and pH is necessary to know how can the scale and, and the corrosion happen. So that's why we uh, investigate this problem. And of course we would like and we have to build a new smart control system to harmonize the three system operation. I think this is the biggest uh, problem and the biggest uh, challenge in this project. But I think after that, uh, we think uh, one year later we, we finished the project. So. After that, uh, this project will be able to contact to other projects like Crow Thermal. So thank you for your attention. If you have any question at the end of the session, we can discuss 
it. Thank you. Thank you, Gabor. I came from Saget, so I can say that my students are very lucky because they learn the practice of geothermal energy utilization as well. So our last presenter of the morning session, uh, Fernando Pardo, who is Director Geotechnical Laboratory of SEDEX. And the title of his presentation, Geothermal Energy in Civil Construction. Please. So hello, good morning. I would like to start thank you by uh, thanking the organizers to, to invite me to be here. And um, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, uh, geothermal energy applications in civil uh, construction works and foundations, especially. Uh, this is the, um, the index of the presentation, a brief introduction and an overview of the different applications of uh, shallow geothermal energy in, in public works and foundations of buildings. Um, a brief uh, reference to a, a research study case in Spain and the conclusions. Well, uh, I will focus on the use of uh, structural elements of the public works and, and buildings as shallow geothermal energy exchangers instead of boreholes as usual. Um, the, um, these elements uh, present um, the advantages of a high thermal transfer capacity of the concrete. Um, the, the tubes, the pipes that we use uh, to as exchangers are, are placed inside these foundation elements. And um, it is a technical and economical solution because it avoids the, the, the installation of these uh, pipes in, in boreholes, especially um, uh, made for, for, for them. So we use uh, um, elements that are going to be uh, built anyhow for, for the building or for, for our work. But um, we have to be sure that uh, the use of these elements as geothermal exchangers um, are not um, going to, 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 to provoke any um, negative um, um, repercussion in our foundation elements. So these elements, uh, we, we use these um, um, energy um, structural elements have a double, double function. They, they have the geothermal function. They, they have to serve as heat exchangers by mean of the, of the pipes they incorporate, but they have, of course, the structural function. These have to support actions. The mechanical actions they, they were supposed to, to, to bear from the structure and the surrounding ground, but also the thermal actions that are going to appear because of the use as geothermal um, elements. Types of these um, energy geostructures are very varied, as, as you can see here. Uh, deep foundations, piles, especially shallow foundations, especially slabs, bottom slabs of buildings, um, energy walls, energy retaining walls, tunnel, tunnel linings, energy tunnels, what we can call, but also pavements, anchors, and some other elements of the, of the structures. Uh, the purposes of using them as in, in shallow geothermal applications can be heating and cooling of superstructures or building uh, above them, the production of hot water, the uh, prevention of icing in pavements, roads, bridges, uh, airports, etc., and uh, also the storage of, of heat. The technology is just, um, well, uh, the pipes, the heat transfer fluid pipes are installed um, in the element, in the fixed to the reinforced cages or embedded in the concrete of these, these structures. These pipes can be placed in different uh, configurations and as you can see in the figures. And um, the exchange of heat in the elements can be through interfaces, air, air solid, when we place them um, at, at the surface in contact with uh, the air in an underground structure or can be solid solid when we are exchanging heat uh, with, the, with the ground. 
uh, of course, it's a multidisciplinary technology. And uh, from the point of view of the geotechnical engineer, that's what I am. So that's my main concern. It's fundamental, as it said here, to guarantee that the heating and cooling of the structural elements do not compromise uh, their structural uh, behavior and function. Um, why is it especially interesting in Spain, the use of these structural elements as uh, geothermal uh, energy um, uh, elements? Well, Spanish city, um, not like the beautiful Hungarian city you have seen before, are very densely urbanized. Our city planning is very, very dense. And there are very few uh, open spaces, open areas at the surface. You can see here an aerial view of Madrid, where we are, Barcelona and Valencia, the three main cities of Spain. And you can see how the city planning is in, in our cities. So it's important. Um, there is a need for using underground space for many things, for transport tunnels, for transport hubs, for metros, of course, parking lots, commercial areas, for many things. The, the, there is that, that, that need. And we can use, uh, we can take advantage of it to, to, to apply and to use the thermal energy solutions. Um, so a, a brief application of the, um, the geothermal energy in public works and foundation of buildings, uh, starting with channels. Um, from the point of view of the thermal condition of the tunnel, we can classify them in what we call cold tunnels. Those are the tunnels that keep all the year around the, a relatively low temperature. They are short tunnels, low, low traffic level, uh, big diameters. So they keep that uh, low temperature and they can be used for heating and cooling. And then we have what we call, we can call hot tunnels. Those are tunnels which uh, keep um, a high uh, average temperature the, all the year around because they are urban tunnels with a lot of traffic, for, for instance, metro tunnels, uh, where the breaking and starting of the, of the trains uh, produces heat. And um, normally we have to cool them down. And uh, another case of these uh, hot tunnels are those uh, deep high mountain tunnels uh, where the heat is coming from the, from, from the ground, from the ground itself. So they can be used, these hot tunnels, for extracting heat for our applications. Well, both kind of tunnels can be used for thermal activation. And, the, and there are different technologies, basically two placing these um, uh, pipes um, uh, directly between the linings of the tunnels with the help, for instance, of uh, geosynthetics, or um, uh, placing these uh, piles, uh, pipes, sorry, in, inside the precast concrete lining segments and then connecting them hydraulically to, to, to build the, the ring circuits. Advantages of energy tunnels, of using tunnels uh, for geothermal, shallow, shallow geothermal applications. Well, there is a limited additional cost to, to prepare them for this use. Uh, they present greater volumes and surface for thermal exchange than the other solutions like uh, boreholes or piles. And uh, we, in the case of hot tunnels, they are producing heat. We, ha we, we should take advantage of that. Well, uh, another type of construction, the, the stations, railway and metro stations, normally in, in the cities, in urban areas. Um, we can use them for heating and cooling too. And here we, we, we place, normally we place the, the heat transfer uh, fluid uh, pipes in, in walls, in retaining walls and slabs instead of um, around the, the lining of a tunnel. Um, another case, I'm going very fast because it's just an overview, is energy pavements um, to prevent, especially to prevent icing and snow in, in pavements in, in the winter. And can be applied uh, shallow geothermal energy in roads, sidewalks, streets, airports, bridges. The exchange of heat with the ground can be, can be uh, carried out by, by means of boreholes uh, piles, horizontal tubes and embankments that are going to be constructed to, to, to place on top of them the, the pavements. So very uh, different solutions. 
and can be used not only for heating in winter, but also for, for cooling down in the summer if, if necessary. Well, as you can see um, in our city in Madrid, some winter, not very often actually, but for instance, last year we had a heavy snowfall and the city was collapsed for, for too many days, including the airport that was closed for several days. I guess in other cities in Europe where, where winters are also extreme, you have uh, similar situations, but I think here uh, your thermal energy could be uh, something very, very, very useful. In any case, in any case, in our in our country, every winter, because we have a lot of mountain ranges, um, a lot of uh, mountain passes and tunnels that have um, uh, many days uh, problems with snow snowfalls, and uh, I think also that uh, the thermal application here could be a nice a nice solution to prevent this uh, cut of of uh, uh, sometimes very important. Uh, uh, roads and railway lines. Well, energy foundations. We can use foundations, um, deep foundations like piles or also shallow foundations and as bottom slabs, di diaphragm walls for, for, for being used as the geothermal exchangers in, in our buildings. The thermal piles is the typical solution. They offer a sustainable solution for achieving building thermal demand. They consist of five foundations combined with the, with the, with the close loop ground sources heat pump systems, provide support for the building. That's the mechanical engineer, civil engineer, and main uh, aim of these uh, elements, but they act also at, at heat uh, source and uh, heat sink. Um, the system performance is influenced by factors like the number of loops, pile length, and soil, soil properties. And um, an advantage related to boreholes is that it can be installed to, to, to shallower depths than them, but a careful design and installation process is needed. Um, and the pile in structural integrity is governed by the magnitude of the applied thermal load. The, the change of temperature is very, very important for the mechanical behavior of, of these elements. Is control uh, for this mechanical behavior uh, by the, the soil profile and by the type of restraint, restraint at, the, at the pile head and, and toe or tip. Um, which is the, um, how do they uh, behave mechanically, these uh, energy piles? Well, when heated, the pile, of course, tends to dilate but uh, only can dilate up to a percentage of the free dilation because it's um, constricted by, by the ground and by the, and by the building on top of them. That's what we call the degree of freedom, that, that percentage of free dilation. As it said here, and it's, it's constricted the dilation by the ground in the, along the shaft of the pile and the, and the tip, and also by the overlay, overlying structure on, on the pile head. Uh, the result is that uh, stresses appear uh, in the pile due to these uh, changes of temperature. And these stresses uh, have to be added to the mechanical stresses it uh, normally has to, to support because of uh, the, the, its function as, as foundation. The thermal stress distribution that appear depends uh, on the soil profile and the boundary conditions. Uh, but the, the good news is that these um, additional stresses of the thermal origin or dilation are, are limited, are limited by, by the change in temperature. If we know which is the change of temperature the, the pile is going to suffer, we know the, the stresses, the additional stresses uh, have a limit uh, or the, the additional movements or the formations are also limited by, by, by this change of temperature. Well, some examples. And um, uh, the third point I wanted to, to, to make mention of is uh, a case of study of um, experimental geothermal pile in, carried out in Spain some years ago, the P10 project uh, funded by the National uh, Plan uh, of, of Research. And um, the partners of this project were SEDEX, this house, the University of, Polytechnic University of Valencia, and the companies Rodeo Cronza and Energesis. The main objective of this study was to, to, to verify the thermomechanical behavior 
of, of an experimental precast energy pile driven in, in Valencia in soft soils, alluvial soils, um, and subjected to mechanical loads, of course, and then to additional uh, thermal, thermal loads. Um, here you can see some details of the pile, um, the dimensions. I'm not going to, to, to stop here in detail. You can, you can check, uh, the, you are interested in this, this, the, the results of this project in this uh, reference. Well, it was a precast, anyhow, precast uh, pile with two, two parts connected with a joint. Um, it has internal instrumentation to measure temperatures and strains during the test. Uh, the application of the mechanical loads on top was, was done by, by means of uh, an anchor metallic frame as a reaction and drags. And of course, we measure uh, externally, we measure movements of the head of the pile and, and the load of the, of the applied loads for during the, the tests. And uh, this is uh, the uh, system to apply the thermal loading. I'm not going to stop here and anyhow. Just um, to mention one of the thermal tests, test uh, we call test C, under a constant vertical load of um, 100 tons and simulating uh, summer mode, uh, heating, the, heating the pile actually. Uh, with uh, three levels of uh, relatively high injection heat injection rates, as you can see in the scheme, temporal scheme of the, the tests uh, that uh, lasted uh, 15 days. And you can see in slide some results. Uh, here you can see to the, to, uh, to, the, to the left, you can see the temperatures along the pile with an increase, an average increase of 15 degrees. Uh, which was significant, but the, the heat injection, as I said, was, was strong. And for instance, to, to, the, to, the, to the right of the slide, you can see the, the movement as the head of the, of the pile, uh, reflecting, obviously, the, the injection of, of heat. And um, more interesting for us also, the, the, the axial loads that we, we got during the, the injection of, of heat. Uh, you can see in this profile uh, the curve to, to, the, to the left is before heating, so the, the, the axial load under the mechanical loads. And uh, then you can see the distribution of axial load al along the pile in the different stages of heating with the red line uh, showing the, the, the maximum. And as you can see, the increase of axial load in the pile is significant. It's uh, about 40% of the axial load. Uh, we had without a thermal thermal uh, loads, so it's it's uh, it's um, very important to take it that into account. We we made some other tests, uh, test E for instance, simulating a more realistic uh, uh, heat injection level in the in the in the pile, um, simulating the case of a, an office building installation during 14 day, days. Um, there was a daily cycle, heating in the morning, heating in the afternoon, and resting during the night. And uh, you see um, the complete test scheme, 14 days, excluding Sundays. Uh, and um, the results were similar to those of the previous test, but with uh, an increase of stress in the pile, lower because of the lower extent of the, of the injected power, heat uh, injected power. Um, but anyhow, an, an increase of the axial load, of course. And also a very interesting, uh, an stabilization of, a stabilization of results with a number of cycles, as you can see in the figure down there with, that represents the movements of, at the head of the, of the pile. So some conclusions of this test, uh, where mm, there was an opposition to dilation of the pile that appeared in this case because of the, of the soil profile in Valencia where it was driven and the restriction at the head. The opposition to dilation appeared at both ends of the pile, the degree of freedom of about 43%. And in general, um, well, the soil profile and the restriction conditions at the pile head determine the thermal mechanical behavior of an, an, energy, an energy pile. The structural resistance, uh, we have to take into account the increase of axial load to, to be sure we have enough structural resistance of this element. 
And this uh, increase of, uh, of stress of actual load depends on, on, on the temperature change. It's going to be only several uh, um, degrees. Uh, it's going to be okay. It's going to be more. It's going to be, has to be analyzed anyhow. And also, not only the structural resistance, but also from the geotechnical point of view, the bearing capacity of the, of the pile as foundation element. We have to analyze how these uh, thermal loads uh, affect our factors of safety, uh, tip and shaft resistance, as we studied in them in, in, from the geotechnical point of view, and, and to calculate and design the, the pile uh, appropriately. And that's all to that point. And some conclusions, general conclusions to the presentation. Well, there, there is a great variety of application of shallow geothermal energy in civil construction. There are many opportunities in urban areas. Uh, the use of uh, underground structural elements as energy exchangers offer advantages. Um, but um, energy activated foundation and structural elements must be properly designed to take into account the, the effect of the thermal actions we are introducing them. And then finally, for the civil engineers, it's very important. In, in Madrid, there are some projects going on uh, to, to, to take advantage of the um, um, underground tunnels and so on that are going to be built and to, to use uh, shallow geothermal energy in them. It's very important for us, for the engineers, for everyone to be sure the, um, the effects of the, uh, the use of geothermal uh, energy in these elements is safe. And it's very important to properly instrument these elements and monitor them to demonstrate, to show to everybody that it's safe and, and useful. Thank you very much. If Fernando may ask you to take your seat because I'd like to invite the presenters to the podium, uh, except Gregor who is sitting in his office. So at first I'd like to ask uh, you in the room, who has a question? I have a question to Gregor in Vienna. Uh, Gregor, very uh, interesting presentation. Thank you very much, but uh, uh, my question would be, did you have also a look on, let's say, hybrid models? So where... Where... Do you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, where hybrid mo models, where, uh, for example, um, geothermal just contrib contributes a part of the energy? Yes, <clears throat> yes. Uh, this is a major part of our work. We are not uh, uh, assuming that uh, geothermal will be the only energy source. It doesn't bring uh, so much benefits because you have the problem of investments in high capacities, which are hardly used. Uh, I also investigated um, from the data uh, of the market report, how is the ratio between the average capacity and the uh, 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 peak capacity, uh, which was indicated by the system itself, to see if there is a big gap in between. And there are quite a few uh, geothermal um, direct use, I'm just talking about direct use now, not about the low temperature system with ground source heat pumps and so on. And you can see that it, it's quite, uh, there is goes up to a number factor of three, meaning that the peak capacity, which was installed, is three times larger than the average capacity. And this should be optimized, in my opinion because it gives a lot of benefits uh, for the installation itself. So meaning uh, operating your pumps uh, uh, stable, uh, for instance, uh, but also to be more economic uh, profitable. Yeah, would you like, uh, it's enough. Okay, thanks. Other questions? If not, may I ask Anita to read? Uh, the question is raised on, online. Yes, so we have received now two questions from the online audience. Um, the first one is from Gregor, actually. He uh, was asking, did the energy supplier of Seged also do the exploration and development of the geothermal sources by himself? And what are supportive business models for district and heating 
operators to develop geothermal energy as geosciences, geothermal development is not the key competence by nature. Yes, of course, okay. long question. So I will read it again. Um, could the energy supplier of SAGET also do the exploration and development of the geothermal sources by himself? Okay, um, well, uh, not the, not the district heating of second not the district heating company of second uh, one of my one of my slides showed uh, a, a consortium and uh, and uh, it, it, it it was it was basically the university of Saged and Imogeo and other research uh, groups and and researchers Janusz included uh, who who were behind exploration uh, also, uh, I, I, I need to admit that just uh, south, uh, southwest, southeast of, oh, sorry, just, just east of Saged, there is a huge gas field, and it's an active gas field, probably the largest in Hungary. So we have quite good data of, of what we can expect. Uh, we have all the all the uh, towns around Saged have already operated a geothermal system. Actually, drilling and exploration was quite low risk. In, in Saged, it was, it, we, we, we had a very good understanding, quite a good knowledge of what we could expect if we start, if we start drilling. And, and actually, we, we didn't have any uh, 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 surprises, uh, if I can say it this way. Uh, we found what we, what we thought we would find. So it was, it was quite easy. But yeah, we did have an exploration group, and that was, that was, that was uh, uh, the uh, geothermal engineers and, and experts, uh, some of them are present in this room, and some of them are. May I add a comment? Uh, yeah, as Tomasz mentioned, there are more than 1,200 hydrocarbon wells surrounding of Saged, and uh, a half part of Saged there is 3D seismic tomography, so uh, it's a well-known area. And the other part. Yeah, there was a question. Uh, this development is not the key comp okay um well as for as for the business model i i could say that that the district heating company is a non-profit it is not true it is it is a for-profit company but but the, the peculiar situation in hungary is that that, that uh, as i i mentioned it in in some of the crowd thermal meetings that but but i will i will be happy to share it to the audience that uh, that the the price of district heating energy is state controlled mm -hmm. And, and uh, this means that uh, this, this is a good news for the public in times of high energy prices, because, because we are not raising our energy prices. The, the, the bills remain the same, but it, they do depend on how much you use, but it doesn't depend on the price of the, of the actual energy source. Uh, this is not so much a good news uh, when, when, when prices are low, because we are actually, we would be so to say foolish to, to decrease our prices because we are not obliged to. But the other thing is, it, it is really somewhat counterproductive uh, and, 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 and counterintuitive when, when it comes to uh, including integrating geothermal or any other source of, of renewable energy. Why would we do it? Uh, that, that's the question. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really an environmental aspect and the social aspect and, uh, and our, our thinking of our future and, and, and things like that. that. That's the reason why we do it. Uh, and, and, and as for the, 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 the business type, it's 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 european funding it's simple as that uh we we if if we can if we can apply for european union funding then this is a, a, a viable this is an economically uh, a sound operation if not then it's simply not because because we are we are not we are not getting our money back that's that, that <laughs> there is no other way to say it the thing is that we are selling the same uh the energy for the same price to the people and 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 uh, the reason why we do it is not financial. The reason why we do it is because, and I know it's, it might sound corny, but that's the truth. The reason why we do it is because we care about our our, our the children's future and we care about our environment. And we would like to make the second aware and cleaner. And we would like to use you know independent energy and and local, and and that's it. That's that, that's the reason. So no other question. 
Oh, there is. Uh, please give the microphone. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the very nice talks. My name is Otto Eliasson. I'm, I'm uh, from Iceland. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, perhaps Adele, because you, we were talking about uh, the future of geothermal energy in, in, in Europe. And, and uh, I mean, can we do anything to forecast? I mean, I, I think I read at some point that uh, the geothermal is about 3% of the European energy mix. Do, do you, or, or, or something? Yeah, maybe I'm wrong on the number, but. But the, how, how do we foresee this this changing? Say in the coming decade, do we have any any prospects? Will it will it double in the coming decade, or or do you think this will be even accelerated with a energy crisis looming and and yeah, etc. Can you comment a bit? Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe also plus with uh, with his uh, speech this uh, so later will also help in uh, clarifying these. Uh, um, uh, we, we need uh, uh, a, a large, such a large increase in renewables in Europe with all the goals that have been set, especially in the last, uh, in, also including those in the last weeks. Uh, if we want to achieve 100% of uh, production by renewables uh, in a uh, short time, uh, uh, we need to accelerate so much. Um, so when uh, we brought uh, uh, the, the vision, uh, we, uh, I had shown you at the moment on 2020, following uh, the, Jack Mark, the last Jack Market uh, uptake, um, the, the, the share, uh, the contribution of geothermal was 1.2%. So, so low in 2020. Those are the last official data. Uh, but it didn't uh, increase so much in the last uh, period, also due to COVID. Uh, so many, many projects uh, remained uh, as they were. So there has been problems, but uh, we want to, we can, we have the potentiality to achieve much, much larger share in the renewable. And uh, I cannot tell you exactly the number, uh, in principle, a large part, in principle, but uh, this depends on, uh, on many things. Uh, we need uh, uh, an acceleration in uh, setting up the infrastructures, for example, for district heatings, because there are so many already, they can be turned on uh, with a share of renewable, uh, uh, so with, with renewable energies and larger share of uh, geothermal, but uh, new infrastructures needs to be, to be built. Uh, so um, this is not uh, for something that we can achieve. A large part of geothermal cannot be achieved uh, in 18 months. Now this is the target. Now it seems that we have to increase in 18 months with a large part of renewables. This is not feasible with geothermal projects that require more time for implementation. Uh, so we need to work on uh, a medium term uh, uh, planning. But uh, with that, uh, I think that we can achieve uh, um, in principle, we could achieve even more than 50%, but, uh, but uh, this is just a principle. It will depend on very much on, uh, on the tools that, uh, that will be set in the, in the next months and years. Uh, but uh, there are many things to be done on this. Thank you. Okay, may I have an overall question? Uh, what do you think about the unused heat? Uh, in, in my practice, I I found that in Hungary, we inject or leave the water higher than 50 or 60 degrees to temperature. So I think we can double the geothermal energy utilization in Hungary if we optimize the system or renew the, the, uh, the uh, heating uh, circles and others. So what do you think about that? There is an engineer part of this topic. So I don't know what is the situation uh, in, in, in Spain, but in Hungary, we have a very old system and uh, uh, the starting temperature for, for district heating, mostly 90 degrees. And if we can reduce it uh, down to 70 or 50, uh, it would be much better to utilize the geothermal energy and we can increase the efficiency, which is very important. But, uh, no, I just I just wanted to uh, uh, second what you think, what, what you just said. Uh, we have many uh, 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 many mayors 
and decision makers coming to us and saying that they have an unused well, say, in, in, in their possession. And, uh, and, and sometimes those wells are, are good and sometimes uh, they, they need some maintenance and, and they can use them. Or they say that they would like to drill a new well. Either way, Janusz is going there and, 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 and he can tell them that you are going to get 90 degrees water out of this well. And then they are very happy because they know that 90 degrees, it, it, it's a lot. You can, you can use that for many things. What they don't consider is that, is that their buildings are built for like 90 per 70 degrees heating. And then basically they are using only the 20 degrees of the, of, of, of the whole range of the water, of the whole energy uh, content of the water. And they are going to uh, uh, re-inject it at, at like say 60 degrees or something like that. And basically, all the all the temperatures below that is unused, and and it, it's 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 not going to trash, but it's going to back into the earth, and and, and it's it's just it's just not once again it's just not economically viable. Uh, obviously, you can do that, and and it's still going to be an operating system. But but the idea is that if you if you add new buildings to it, or even better, when you build new buildings and you know that there is an existing well or there is an existing uh, geothermal pl plant or any, anything like that. And, 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 and you plan the building according to that to a lower degree, then, then you are getting free energy basically. And, and it's, 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 it's a beautiful thing to do. And so few municipalities think this way. It's, it's, it's just, out, out, you know, you just can't understand it. That, that when, and, and even in Saget, when there is, a, when there is a, new, a, a new building and then they don't consider that there is already an existing geothermal network which uses the, 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 the 90 to 90 to 70 degrees and even you you the only thing you need to do is plan it to 60 to 40 and that's it and then you get free energy if you, if you plan it to 90 to 70 you are not going to get energy you, you need to use gas it's easy as that yeah so this is a very important message for civil engineers that plan the building with low temperature heating it's quite important okay any other questions oh there is sorry Yeah, uh, Gregory, can you hear me? You, you can hear me? Okay. So first of all, thank all of you for your nice and interesting presentations. Um, I have one last question to Fernando, to your presentation, um, because I like really this idea of combining things, combining positive effects, and what you presented about um, the, the uh, geothermal applications and, and structural elements. And I was wondering how you see the realistic potential for this in future regarding, of course, you, you showed the right, really broad variety of applications, but, and I can good imagine how to um, integrate this in, in new build constructions, but how to deal with all these existing buildings and the efforts and let's say some challenges. So what, yeah, I'm really interested in how you see the potential for, for these applications. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for the, for the question. Uh, that's a very appropriate question because as you can see, our cities are already built. Uh, we are not going to, to change all the foundations of our cities to, to install uh, uh, geothermal pipes. But it's true that, that little by little, for instance, in Madrid, there are new uh, developments of buildings, and they are trying to to use these 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 elements in the foundations, in the parking underground parking lots, and uh, also in the infrastructures, in tunnels, stations, and so on. It's it's useful. It's useful in in a, in, 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 in a small level because you are going to to use it for heating and cooling of the station of some buildings uh, very locally. But it's, it's interesting, that should be done. That's my point of view. And on the other hand, um, out of the cities, for instance, in the, in the, in the mountain roads, I think it's, it's uh, very obvious that you, could, you should use that to avoid the uh, uh, cutting of roads in, in, the, in the winter in, in our country, which happens uh, every winter, many days, and it's uh, unnecessary. We, we could, could do things like that. And, uh, uh, could be implemented, uh, I think, already. The tunnels are built, but you could implement some solutions for that. And uh, in airports, maybe also. So thank you very much, all presenters, this value of representation.